I, I suggest that we get started. So, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for being here uh, for this uh, special session of the uh, SEOG. Well, actually, it is a special session for different reasons. And the first one is because we, uh, it's a, actually, it's a co-organized session by the SEOG, but also by the, our Center for uh, Constitutional Research at the Institute for European Studies and the uh, Center of International and European Law of the uh, UCL. And um, before introducing our guest, who is the second reason why this, this session is a bit special, um, I would like just to um, thank very, very warmly uh, Stéphanie Franck, uh, whom I guess you all know more or less. She is a professor of uh, EU law and international private law in uh, UCL. She's uh, the vice dean of uh, the law faculty at UCL. And she She's at the origin of this. So uh, she basically wrote to Francois Ost and me a few months ago saying, well, thanks to the Louvain Global College of Law scheme, uh, we, have, we had a chance to attract uh, uh, a very bright colleague from the US and uh, she's interested in law and literature. I know that you have an interest in law and literature and uh, would you, would you, it wouldn't it be great to do something together? So of course we enthusiastically said yes um, and even more so because uh, we, well, at least, yeah, a, a number of people here in this room started a collective research on uh, European judicial narratives, which also has some law and literature um, elements to it. Um, and so uh, it was uh, just great to hear that uh, Professor Elizabeth Anker uh, wanted or was uh, interested in uh, in European uh, integration, European constitutionalism, and that she was uh, willing to uh, give a speech on that topic. So, uh, Elizabeth Anker, thank you so much for being with us uh, today. You have a very um, fascinating background, really. So, from you have a legal background, you acted as a law as a lawyer, as a law professional, but you also have uh, an uh, English literature. Uh, PhD, um, you are both um, an academic at the uh, English department of the Cornell uh, University, but also you work at the uh, law faculty. So this is a really, I mean, it may be quite common in the US, but for us, it's like, you know, <laughs> extra uh, So that's, um, so, so this is really interesting. And, and what you decided to, uh, to present us today is um, also very interesting because uh, if, I, if I understood correctly, the uh, the title of your well, it's actually yeah, I have ah, I like the wrong it. title. <laughs> but, oh yes, you changed <laughs> I it. I couldn't but remember I, uh, what title I gave because you because the title was. Notes, but but so. anyway, I think I, yeah, I guess the content will be pretty much yeah, the same. Well, what is, I can... screening screening uh, immigrant rights and the limits of European constitutionalism. Oh, that that's the title yeah. I removed this ah, morning. Right, okay, I but, thought it was but still, wrong. I mean, these are when I when I first read that 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 I was like, okay, so you are taking. I guess the two most controversial topics in European studies, <laughs> and you mix them together, and I'm very curious to see what was going to come out of it. So, no, no, really. So, thank you so much for being here. And um, yeah, the, the last thing I, I just uh, wanted to say was that this is, if I remember correctly, a, a, a speech that you drew from a new book from you. Our Constitutional Metaphors being the title of it, and it is not yet for sale, otherwise we would have already so I, I bought a number of them, of course, here, but uh, this was just uh, some uh, piece of uh, uh, advertisement, uh, just to say uh, that this is a book that's going to be published uh, anytime soon. So the floor is, the floor is yours. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, um, Antoine and Stephanie, for hosting me. Um, and to you all for coming out on a dreary day. Um, you'll have to forgive me. I have a bit of a cold, so... Um, One um, wonders for what yeah. reason. You <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, but um, my French is very poor, so I'm obviously going to do this in English, but um, don't hesitate to slow me down if at any point I'm racing ahead at too quick of a pace or what have you. Um, as Antoine said, this is indeed from a book that I'm working on. Um, it's a book I've been working on for a little while, but decided to put to the side while I finish another project. So I still have to do a huge amount of research on it. Um, this is some of the earliest material that... Um, I began working on for this book. Um, basically what the book is, is it's a comparative study of the constitution, of different constitutions, and especially moments of constitutional crisis or failure. Um, um, and the way I've envisioned this chapter is trying to think about um, why the movement for a formal European constitution failed. 
Um, that's kind of the question that drives it. Um, um, I should forewarn that the chapter is very literary. Um, most of what I do in it is analyze a series of films that I'm kind of arguing offer um, shed light on why the consti why that movement broke down, um, um, why there was this resistance to a formal European constitution. So, so while the book that this will be part of and probably, oh, I'll be happy if it's out in five years, um, <laughs> um, okay. will be very much about law, the material I'm presenting today is more about film and kind of culture and how culture gives shape to law and legal debates. Um, um, so just a few words of preface um, to that. Um, um, in a way, few thinkers have shaped debates about um, both human rights and citizenship and the nation state than Hannah Arendt. Um, um, already in 1950, Arendt observed that if you deny citizenship to a people or a population, you in effect rob them of their human rights. Um, um, so if we want to think about human rights, we very much need to think about um, um, the nation state basically since the beginning. Um, um, and we really can't, for Arendt, again, talk about um, um, rights and citizenship without looking at the nation's ability to um, both um, denationalize and exclude people. Um, in recent years, Arendt's reflections, um, most notably from the origins of totalitarianism, have only really gained visibility um, because of how much they speak to contemporary, right, the predic contemporary predicament of the state, both in Europe um, and in places like the United States. Um, and I have images from films, but a couple other images as well. I've given this talk in different formats, um, once to a bunch of 18-year-olds. So some of the images um, serve that. Um, Arendt's insights were, of course, prompted by the fate of Europe in the wake of World War II, um, as masses of homeless populations um, um, took shelter in refugee camps. Um, I always find these numbers staggering. Um, during the war, estimates are that Stalin and Hitler together uprooted more than 30 million people, right? In 1945, the UN um, Re Relief and Rehabilitation Administration was still managing almost 7 million people with another 7 million under Soviet authority. Um, and then there were also millions of homeless Germans. Um, um, this is in part because the various peace and other treaties redrew the borders of different nation states, right? So the simple redistribution of European land was what led to a lot of homelessness. Um, um, and that, um, that um, um, reality, um, um, for instance, led the historian Tony Jutt to describe um, contemporary post-war European states as, quote, even more ethnically homogenous than before the war, um, um, according to Tony Jutt. Um, the refugee problem persisted until 1957. Um, that was when the last displaced persons camp was dismantled. Um, so while Hannah Arendt was writing and thinking with respect to this very um, historically specific problem, her insights continue to speak um, very much to realities, not only in Europe, but really globally and even within the United States, increasingly so. Um, um, it's interesting, I began working on all of this material um, long before Brexit. Um, um, and at the time, I was referring to this as sort of specific to Western Europe. Um, but increasingly, it's also specific to the United States, um, the problems I'm really trying to wrestle with. Um, um, so what I'm kind of trying to take stock of, um, we can think about it as a Eurosceptic backlash, right? Um, but in fact, um, I think it's also tied to forms of proto-nationalism, um, the resurgence of particular nationalist sentiments um, that, again, I think came to something of a head. Um, in the um, 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 breakdown of the movement for a formal European constitution. Um, um, and in many ways, these are questions that scholars are actively trying to explain and make sense out of, right? Um, some people refer to this as populism, um, kind of a resurgence of populism. I think proto-nationalism is perhaps a more effective term. Um, um, so you seen proto-nationalism? Yeah, proto-nationalism is really a term. Explain, you know, what you would um, that it, I think it marks the sense that we're witnessing new forms or expressions of nationalism okay. mm -hmm. um, um, that aren't purely xenophobic, right? Um, that aren't purely reactionary, right? That aren't purely about returning to the origins that also have economic factors built into them, right? Um, I think 
populism is also something of a misnomer because there are questions about whether today's expressions of populism um, mirror those of earlier moments, right, earlier historical eras. Um, populism, of course, takes a very different shape um, in a different national context. Um, so I think, again, my sense is that academics in the U.S., right, the sort of post-Trump, what does this all mean, right, um, or during Trump, rather, what does this yeah. all mean, <laughs> we wish. Um, yeah. um, um, but so people are very much questing for, right, the terminology to describe what's going on, right, with a lot of these reactionary movements. Um, 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 one way, of course, that proto-nationalism manifests itself is in terms of a hostility to immigrants. Um, um, this is, of course, ironic, given how stateless populations are only multiplying right now. Um, um, one way to explain the growth of anti-immigrant sentiment is, of course, as a negative byproduct of globalization. Um, um, this is further ironic because beyond supranational structures, there are other ways in which nation-state jurisdiction and sovereignty is increasingly being eroded and superseded by external pathways of influence and control, whether the economy, things like global trade, um, things like the digital, um, um, religious allegiances. Um, and while these um, kind of mobile new forces do in fact erode the sovereignty of the state, um, um, they can also trigger forms of anxiety, um, and those anxieties of globalization are frequently projected onto immigrants, right? If we want to think about the rise of anti-immigrant sentiment, right? It can be almost seen as something of a backlash um, um, against globalization. Um, another irony that many scholars have pointed to is the fact that the rise of human rights standards can actually exacerbate um, forms of proto-nationalism. Um, so insofar as human rights norms are seen as merely one component of globalization, um, that can actually um, backfire in certain ways. For instance, the anthropologist Arjun Apaturai um, has explained these links in very salient terms. Um, he describes how, and he's referring mostly to the global south, but I think this refers to the world at large, um, and I'll quote Apaturai for a minute. Um, During the 1980s and 90s, many nation states had to simultaneously negotiate two pressures, these are his words, the pressure to open up their markets to foreign investment commodities and images, and the pressure to manage the capacity of their own cultural minorities to use the globalized language of human rights to argue for claims for cultural dignity and recognition. Um, he argued that th these dual pressures, again, including the pressure to actually um, rely on human rights, produced a crisis in many countries for the sense of national boundaries, um, and it's directly responsible for the growth of majoritarian racism. This is Apaturai again. So Apaturai is interesting to me because he actually attributes the ascendancy of human rights discourse to um, sort of a reactionary rise of um, you know, xenophobic nationalisms, right? That human rights, um, according to him, are often an outside influence that the anxiety about which gets projected onto immigrants, right? So there's a way in which um, the global currency of human rights can be seen as almost self-sabotaging in certain contexts. Whether we agree with that, it's, you know, an interesting way to think about some of these links. Um, um, one other kind of insight into some of these debates before I um, talk about the films that are going to be my examples. Um, the political theorist Wendy Brown, um, she's at UC Berkeley, has also written a book that explains some of these tensions. Um, it's called Walled States, Waning Sovereignty. In the book, um, Brown is interested in the rise of borders, walls, right, the wall that Trump wants to construct on the U.S.-Mexico border, and other kind of physical demonstrations or displays of national sovereignty. For Brown, these are deeply ironic um, because what she argues is that it's not accidental that we see these displays of the state, displays of nationalism cropping up precisely at the moment that in reality, national sovereignty is just being eroded, right? Um, it's just a fact, right? That the nation state jurisdiction is increasingly being subordinated, right? To um, other channels and flows of goods, peoples, monies, religions, et cetera, et cetera, right? So there's something in her analysis about how these, um, again, displays of power are kind of a last, you know, dying gasp, right, of the state, right? And the more the state is perceived as fragile and insecure, 
the more likely it is that it's going to engage in some of these really theatrical displays of sovereignty, is her thinking. Um, um, so there's a way in which um, certain symbols for the nation that are meant to suggest homogeneity, unity, enclosure, safety, and the so forth, um, are going to become very visible um, and actualized precisely when um, they don't necessarily map onto reality. Um, so I'll turn to some of my shift gears for a minute and turn to some of my literary examples. Um, but those are a few frameworks to think about. Um, again, the rise of some of this um, proto-nationalism, or whatever we want to call it, um, um, that we'll be wrestling with. It's in the midst of this climate that um, many, a number of European films have contended um, explicitly in their plots with human rights abuses inflicted on unauthorized immigrants. And today what I'm going to be doing is looking at a couple different films kind of in passing. Um, and I'm interested in how, some, how certain themes and motifs and forms of symbolism circulate across and recur across these films, right? Obviously, these directors didn't get together and say, ooh, let's symbolize the nation this way. Why don't you do it too, right? Um, so we're seeing um, um, almost kind of by randomly, right, um, a collection of films think about challenges to the nation state through very similar kind of symbolic economy, and that's what I'm going to be wrestling with. Um, 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 and many of these films as well um, reckon with another contradiction that underlies a lot of anti-immigrant policy, which is how it disavows economic reality, right? Um, um, anti-immigrant sentiment typically revives kind of an imagined nation that's cohesive, integrated, homogenous, self-contained. Um, um, it's often about, these proto-nationalisms are often about political belonging that's also organicist, vitalist, spontaneous, right? Kind of a populist sentiment. Um, um, but in the way those expressions of nationalism also actively neglect, neglect right, economic reliance um, and dependence on immigrant populations um, um, and how that kind of labor is actually crucial to maintaining forms of wealth and prosperity. Um, so like, have people seen um, um, Gonzalez Signoriti's Beautiful or um, the Dardenne Brothers, La Promesse, or um, Lorna's Silence? It's fun. I've given this talk different places over the years and have never been to Belgium before. And so <laughs> I'm talking about La Promesse and I'm like, oh, wait a second. Um, <laughs> and then um, Dirty Pretty Things is the other one that I'll talk about with some depth. So anyway, I'm going to show some images um, um, from those. Um, and a number of these films, these are just scenes from La Promesse, um, transit papers change hands almost obsessively um, um, over and over again, the exchange of passports, documentation, um, um, work permits and the like is shown changing hands in ways that actively conscript um, undocumented immigrants into forms of illegal or other labor. Um, for instance, the protagonists in Dardenne Brothers, La Promesse, that's a 1996 film, and also um, Gonzalo Signoritu's Beautiful, um, earn their livings by smuggling and basically imprisoning immigrants in unsafe, dangerous working conditions. And um, the main characters in the other two films I'll discuss, Dirty Pretty Things and Lorna Silence, um, are themselves immigrant victims of these rather extortionist bargains, right, or being captive in certain ways. Um, as you might remember, the dominant storyline of La Promesse follows a father-son team who are dealers in the um, labor of illegal immigrants. Um, the, the father, Belgian um, um, Olivier Gourmet and um, Igor Jeremy Renier, they manage um, a flop house where um, newly arrived undocumented immigrants crash um, and they basically force them to work on a construction site for a future apartment building. Um, and so rather than to take rent payments, um, they make them work and they kind of hold them captive. Um, and basically the film's dramatic action is set in motion when one particular immigrant from Burkina Faso, Amidou, falls as he's trying to avoid a labor inspection raid and is killed in the fall. Um, 
Um, um, as he's dying, he extracts an immigrant, um, a promise from young Igor to look after his wife and child, hence la promesse, right? Um, um, and um, he does so, however, um, midway through the film, in order to escape legal interference, the father Roger doesn't want his body to be found, so he actually buries him in the concrete. Um, of the this what, that's going to make up the structure, um, highly symbolic, right? Because we have here the dead body of the immigrant, um, literally in the ground that's going to hold up the future domicile of Europe, right? Kind of future living space of Europe, right? So there's a way in which the film literalizes, right, the reliance of European prosperity and living space um, on the abused human rights of the immigrant, right? Um, of course, we could say that that body's going to decompose and the structure might fall down, right? If we want to push that symbolism a bit further. Um, but it's very overt, right, about linking um, abusive immigrant labor to the future of, you know, this European apartment building. It's also not accidental that Roger and Igor kind of rationalize their mistreatment of these immigrants by saying, by explaining that they're using it to save for a mortgage for a home, right? So they, again, they justify um, mistreating these immigrants um, as well to kind of secure their own familial future um, and domestic space, right? So again, a pretty explicit link um, between um, human rights abuses of the immigrant and the future of um, um, the um, European family, so to speak. Um, um, beautiful, the, the um, film by the Mexican-American director Gonzalo Sinar, who too um, is a film set in Barcelona. It also concerns the black market and illegal labor. Um, its protagonist, Uxbal, played by Javier Bardem, is a middleman. He trades, brokers the labor of um, different illegal immigrant groups. For instance, he gets for Senegalese street merchants various like pirated Gucci, Gucci bags. So he's helping this immigrant community out. Um, and then he's also overseeing um, um, the labor of a large group of Chinese workers who were smuggled um, into Barcelona and are being basically held captive by their kingpins, forced to live in these very kind of unsanitary, unsafe conditions, and also to labor, right? Um, um, so all of these examples of smuggling. Um, Uxbal is interesting in that he also insists in the film, the dialogue says, he doesn't exploit the immigrants, he's helping them to get work, right? So the, it, it kind of gives the lie to the humanitarian fantasies that can um, underlie some of these policies or forms of neo-colonial paternalism. And he also justifies um, these actions because he sees them as necessary for providing for his two children. He has sole custody over his two children and much of the film concerns what's going to happen to them. But again, um, um, kind of the abuse of unauthorized labor is directly suggested to be fiscally, nature, fiscally necessary to the future of the European family. Um, and so on the one hand, Beautiful kind of has two plots, one of which concerns the fate of these two immigrant groups. Um, first, the police come to crack down on the Senegalese, the street merchants. They're all deported, right? And Uxbal feels terrible about that. And then he actually himself negligently kills all of the Chinese. Um, another really harrowing um, thought plot thread. However, he thinks he's helping them. Um, the Chinese are ho housed in this large, um, cold warehouse. It's winter. So he goes out and buys them a bunch of kerosene space heaters. You can see where this is going. Um, and in that unventilated, uh, unventilated space, the heaters basically asphyxiate them all in mass, right? So you have these, um, and it's very graphic in terms of how it zeroes in on these dead bodies with vomit and everything. Um, um, something of another metaphor for what happens to European immigrants, right? They're housed in this kind of liminal, extra legal space, right? Um, and their fate too, in a way they're suffocated or asphyxiated on the lethal air of European xenophobia um, and a failure of inclusion, right? Um, um, so the impl implication as well is that um, these immigrants are killed by the sacrifices that they're willing to make in order to gain European citizenship, right? So again, a lot of this is literalized by way of the plot in the film. 
Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of one plot about these um, immigrants. Um, the film's other main plot thread, however, and I, I, I don't know, if it's, I sent an article that deals with some of these, a little bit of a reading of the film. I don't know if people read it. Probably not. I hope not. Um, okay. Um, the other main plot thread actually deals with bu with Uxbal's dying of prostate cancer. Um, so the film follows him up until his death. Um, it's an incredibly slow death, and much of the diegesis of the film is really engrossed with his particular ailment. So there'll be close-ups of a nurse drawing blood, and it goes on and on. It's like cringeworthy. You have to look away. All sorts of other shots, sorry, of his bloody urine entering a, to a dirty toilet bowl. So it's making us think about his dying and death and all of these precise ailments. Um, um, there are also um, images of him fainting, of him soiling himself, um, again, as he's dying. Um, and I'd like to suggest that this film's kind of preoccupation with um, the breakdown of Uxbal's body is highly significant for thinking about the European nation state. Um, um, in a way, the specific symptoms of his cancer themselves offer um, a very specific commentary on the, um, the, the nature of um, European nationalism. And again, specifically because he's actually financially dependent on European labor, right? So he's something of a... Um, um, a um, um, figure for the nation state. And we can think here about the fact that he's dying from prostate cancer, right? It's shedding a lot of light on this. One of the de de definitions of the prostate is that it's a person who stands before a leader or a chief, right? So the symbolism, right? Again, this is seems kind of strategic um, on the filmmaker's part, um, that he's, he's suggesting that Uxfall is actually kind of a stand-in for European sovereignty, right? We can think about his symptoms, right? His growing incontinence and the loss of control over his bodily functions, almost it signals a collapse in the excre excre I can't say that word, excretory, good thing I'm not a doctor, excretory system, right? Again, sort of the European body politic. Um, with the breakdown of the prostate, his body is unable to regulate itself and also kind of overexcited, as in an overexcited um, European uh, immigration, anti-immigration policy, right? His disorder also inhibits his ability to um, be sexually active, right? The idea that he's going to abandon his children when he dies. Um, um, and so in any case, his, faith, his fate both marks the kind of collapse or breakdown of national sovereignty um, um, and everything it stands for. Um, and in this respect, I'd like to suggest that the timing of these films um, 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 also requires that they um, beg to be analyzed against the backdrop not only of waning European so state sovereignty like Uxbal's, um, but also of debates about regional constitution and the vitality of the European Union, right? Because what, when Uxbal's bodily body breaks down, there's a way in which his bodily constitution, right, is also failing. Um, so I think constitutionalism um, is very much on the mind of these films. Um, um, as we know, the early 21st century witnessed the onset and then the speedy collapse of the movement for a formal European constitution, and then, of course, almost 12 years later to the date, um, Brexit. Um, whereas the, you guys probably know this stuff better, I'm not from Europe, so for me, like, all these details about Europe are new and exciting, um, so I, I don't even need to tell you the dates on things like the Lisbon Treaty, um, but as we know, in May and June of 2005, first France and then the Dutch voted no, um, opposing the Constitution, um, these no votes do raise questions about what about a Constitution right, was unacceptable, right? Is there something about the symbolism of what a European constitution would have furnished um, or what is at stake, right? What the claims of a constitution would be. Um, so there are questions about why was a constitution unacceptable, even though, um, right, Treaty of Rome had been around for over 50 years, um, right, common currency, economic integration, all of those things have been a reality for some time. Um, so I guess one of the questions I'm trying to ask by way of this is why in particular a constitution would prove intolerable, right, rather than all of these other treaties and legal and economic forms that work to, for all intents and purposes, right, um, integrate Europe, right? I mean, people refer, have referred to me at least, I'm curious if this is general knowledge, is right, the Lisbon Treaty is the real constitution of Europe, right? <laughs> um, 
No. Is that, do people say that, or would that be like, huh? Okay. From a legal perspective, yeah. From a legal perspective. Yeah, from a legal perspective. Okay, phew. Um, for Jürgen Habermas, um, precisely the prioritization of the economy has stalled the acceptance of other principles tied to democracy and rights. Um, Already in 1992, Habermas argued that the existence of a common market directly caused, quote, the democratic processes that have gone hand in hand with the nation state to lag hopelessly behind the supranational form taken by economic in in integration. What he refers to as a chauvinism of prosperity subordinates all other factors to economic imperatives. Um, and his estimate only kind of reinforcing the age-old conflict between capitalism and democracy. He wants to see capitalism and democracy as not, you know, handmaidens, but actually sort of opposed. So some people would argue that precisely, right, the priority of these economic agreements means that democracy is going to get, you know, short shrift, right, or left by the wayside. Um, uh, we can agree with that or not. Um, um, but I'd like to suggest that these um, films I'm analyzing can also help us understand additional factors underlying the French and no votes, insofar as they return us um, first to Hannah Arendt's classic reflections, um, um, but also what Wendy Ruf Brown refers to um, in her book on the kind of walls, right, and symbolism is sort of the theological remainders of the nation state and in particular of national sovereignty. Um, 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 sorry, I'm wondering if I should change over some of this. And in a way, it is important to note as we think about this that these anxieties about immigration, whoops, I don't want to go there yet, um, do in fact register actual migration shifts in Europe. Um, 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 Europe's status as a destination for vast inflows of people from around the world um, is quite recent, actually. It's really not until the 1970s that people migrated to Europe. Um, in the immediate post-war decades, when Arendt was writing, population movements were primarily internal to Europe from one country or region to the next. Um, and then, of course, during the early 19th and 20th centuries, Europe was mainly a site of exodus, right, or outflow. Um, so it's really only in the past 40 years or so that Europe has become a crossroads and stopping point for migrants. Um, what this has meant is that certain regions of especially Euro southern Europe, like Barcelona being a prime one, have become transit zones, right, or temporary layovers for people bound for other countries. Um, and this has multiplied black markets tied to smuggling. Um, most studies today suggest that human trafficking has become significantly more profitable than dealing in contraband drugs or arms. So of the various black markets, the kind of stuff these films are involved with is actually the most lucrative, studies suggest. Um, 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 but in any case, to return to some of these texts um, and further ask why why this dying protagonist who's dying of prostate cancer can um, shed additional light on some of these tensions. Um, as a legal form, the, the term constitution, um, to think more about what's at stake in a constitution, um, carries a long and diverse pedigree. Um, it's traceable at least to Aristotle's discussion of the Athenian constitution in antiquity. Um, so again, the Constitution has this very long kind of philosophical pedigree. <clears throat> Early 17th century constitutions were instead referred to as charters and, or fundamental orders, and it was not really until the um, late 18th century that the word Constitution entered popular parlance, um, and primarily to designate state charters that were democratic in spirit. So the French Constitution, the United States Constitution, the Cadiz Constitution of Spain. Um, these early examples of what some term enlightened constitutions were actively shaped by the philosophy of thinkers like Thomas Hobbes, John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Um, and these philosophers frequently relied on specific symbols or metaphors or images also traceable to the Middle Ages and beyond as they attempted to describe the ideal structure and organization of a constitutionally bound political community. Um, um, here, for instance, is the front's piece of Hobbes's original um, Leviathan, and it suggests, right, um, shows us an image of the, the sovereign as a body politic, right? 
um, um, the Leviathan th famous, famously begins with an itemization of the artificial man that comprises the great Leviathan called a commonwealth or state in Latin civitas. For Hobbes, this metaphor of the body politic um, actually helped to justify an absolutist state. Um, he was in favor of absolutism ruled by an autocratic sovereign. So we could think about contemporary authoritarianisms today is not all that aberrant in the long history of constitutionalism. Um, um, Rousseau also invoked the image of a bo the notion of a body politic to describe a well-functioning republic or democracy. Um, for instance, here is the beginning of his political economy. Um, he describes a well-ordered state with the sovereign representing the head and the citizens being the body and the members that make the machine move, live, and work, right? So again, he's explicitly appealing to the idea of human anatomy to kind of model what leads to a, a well-functioning democracy. Um, the notion of biology is also implicit to the etymology or history of the word constitution. Here is simply um, kind of a historical definition from the Oxford English Dictionary, the um, dictionary in, the, in English that compiles all of these historical um, valences, right? This idea that a constitution speaks to the nature of the body. Um, so the basic genealogy of the constitution as a legal term is wrapped up with ideas about the vitality and organic naturalness of the human body, right? Um, and again, what I'm trying to wrestle with, right, or make sense out of uh, how those associations still kind of emerge today, right, in popular debate, um, and actually kind of work to underlie a lot of contemporary nationalisms, right? <coughs> I'm gonna briefly, um, um, in a way, this imagery of the body politic um, is merely one in a wide collection of common metaphors for constitutions. Um, um, others include in the United States, the common most frequent symbolism is usually that of the pen and ink. If, you're, if somebody's going to give you a symbol for the constitution, they would give you something like this. Um, um, architectural language and images of buildings, trees, here's an image of the Indian, what the Indian constitution does. Um, um, here are famous words from Abraham Lincoln on the eve of the American Civil War, a house divided, right? Um, um, thinking about constitution as a building or architecture. Um, it's also routine to display constitutions. This is the cover of the South African Constitution. It's a little hard to see, but it's being portrayed as like an edifice or a structure. Um, um, other images for constitutions um, portray them as domiciles, right? This idea that people who draft constitutions are framers um, captures that. Um, um, that significant. So if we think back to something like La Promesse, it's perhaps not um, accidental that the father-son team justify um, their mistreatment of immigrants as saving for a future home or house or domicile. There's a way in which even that symbolism invokes the meaning of a constitution, right? Or the constitution of a state. <clears throat> so in any case, um, what can we say about all of this? There's simply, there's simply others, another here we see trees and bodies this is another symbol for the South African constitution. Um, kind of a body there. Whoops, do we, do we want, oh, and here this, <coughs> I'm sorry, my cold is suddenly beginning to set in. Um, another um, um, sub-definition of the term constitution from the Oxford English Dictionary um, um, that describes it as, again, kind of a building or self-conscious structure. Um, uh, so in any case, Um, what can we say about all of this? Um, in a way, these different metaphoric or symbolic associations um, with the basic word constitution um, suggest a lot about the power um, of what constitutions are expected to achieve, right? Um, um, that they're founding documents um, um, in more ways than just legal, right? They also have these kind of cultural meanings and popular meanings um, that also get conveyed in the word. Um, and one of the things I'm trying to think about in the book, which this material will be, will be kind of one example or chapter from, is why particular symbols or metaphors come to be controlling and authoritative in different, different contexts, right? 
historical. Um, why is it that in the United States, it's the pen and ink, the quill and ink that represents the U.S. Constitution? <laughs> why is it that um, in South Africa, the image of the house, right, or domicile or architectural structure has become controlling? <clears throat> and why is it in contemporary Europe that we see all of these films um, thinking about nationalism and the crisis of the nation state by way of kind of the body politic, right? Um, or forms of families and bodies that are somehow diseased and unwell. Um, to me, it seems not accidental um, that, that that symbolism emerges with such frequency and we can actually look to it to tell us something about kind of larger legal political debates. Um, um, so asking why that came to be the case. Um, um, and I think it's important that, um, to think as well about um, constitutional, yeah, I'm gonna refer, not turn, turn to my films, um, about, constitu about these metaphors for constitutions is also quite conservative perhaps, right? They're not um, you know, necessarily good things. Um, for instance, the scholar, the historian Victoria Kahn argues about the Leviathan that precisely the power of language is why Hobbes defended an absolutist state. Um, absolutism for Hobbes basically became a way of disciplining metaphor, um, of reigning in its transformative powers. Um, um, so these metaphors can be a bit doubled or complicated. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some of the films um, that I'm analyzing to show how these kind of further play out. Um, um, to return simply to La Promesse, um, uh, well, you guys all happen to know, um, um, for instance, kind of Roger and Igor, the father-son team, are certainly kind of corrupt in how they treat I immigrants, but that cor corruption also plays out um, in more bodily or visceral ways. Um, for instance, they're portrayed as almost sickly. Roger's eyeglasses, it's hard to tell from this, are so thick that you can't actually see his eyes whenever the camera focuses on them. Um, Igor's malnutrition is visible on his teeth. He has visibly rotting front teeth. Um, and their relationship is recurrently depicted as almost incestuous. For instance, there are these scenes of Roger, the father, bathing his adolescent son. This happens throughout the film over and over. Um, he orchestrates Igor, his son's first sexual encounter. Um, he's almost constantly invading his bodily privacy. For instance, there are a couple scenes in which he gives him a tattoo. I don't know if people remember this. Um, and then another moment where he buys him a ring that's so tight Igor can't even get it off. The tattoo and ring are kind of classic insignia of sovereignty, right? Of, you know, the king, right? And kind of that, those sorts of branding as well. Um, Roger is also kind of paranoid about um, racial impurity. So there's a way in which even um, this father son team, right, are suggested to kind of incarnate, right, or bodily demonstrate forms of European corruption and decay and sickliness, right? Um, this is that moment. Should I, five minutes less or five minutes longer? Oh, that to ten, ten minutes. Uh, okay. We still have ten, ten, oh, fifteen okay. minutes. Oh, okay. Okay, so. great. Um, um, so, um, so in any case, even in La Promesse, right, there's a way in which um, their, their decay, right, um, they kind of are figures for European decay and its exploitation of immigrant lives. Um, um, another film by the Dardenne brothers that I'll talk about really briefly, um, Lauren the Silence, have people seen it? What's the word? In Silence de Rona. Yeah. Um, it's also about immigrant populations, um, although here um, Lorna is the main character um, and she gets kind of trapped in the illegal market for sham marriages where wealthy Eastern Europeans gain citizenship by marrying a Belgian national, right? Um, and she first gains citizenship by you know, signing up for one of these, right? She marries a guy who turns out to be a junkie. Jeremy Renier is a junkie in that film. Um, um, and then suddenly she finds herself kind of trapped by her Eastern European mob bosses. They expect her to be a marriage mule. Any people know that term? People refer to, you know, drug mules or people who smuggle drugs. They swallow them and fly somewhere, right? So she's kind of a marriage mule where she is expected to marry these Eastern European men um, in order to get them citizenship now that she has her, again, I'm not sure this would actually work, but whatever, um, <laughs> I'll deal with the film. Um, in any case, the plot, that's kind of the backdrop to the plot. Most of the plot um, has to do with when she believes herself to be pregnant. Um, 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 this is striking because um, 
On the one hand, it, man it, it renders her unfit as a marriage mule. Her potential clients kind of don't want to be with a pregnant woman, right? Raising questions about whether she's um, supposed to um, kind of consummate these fake marriages. Um, but in a way, these marriages also become kind of a symbol for the sacrifices to which the immig immigrant has to consent in order to gain citizenship, right? Um, the implication is that she's supposed to, you know, almost prostitute herself, right, physically, um, in order to gain access to, to Europe, right? Um, but it also returns us to the status of the family, right, and the kind of organic nature of the bond um, that is a prelude to citizenship. <clears throat> and in a way, Lorna Silence is pretty smart that way. It forces us to think about what social scientists refer to as a feminization of migration, um, trends are that migrants um, are increasingly disproportionately female and assigned to particular kinds of undervalued labor. For instance, a study of um, the demographics of British brothels is fascinating. Um, statistics are that in 1997, um, non-nationals made up only 15% of the women in those brothels. Ten years later, 2007, that number had jumped to 85%. Right, um, so you're seeing the sex trade, for instance, become um, massively right ethnicized and racialized. Right, like suddenly, you know, overwhelmed by undocumented immigrants in a lot of countries. Right, um, um, so I just have that one statistic. Um, but in any case, it's not fa you know it's not accidental here that kind of sexuality, pregnancy, et cetera. Um, um, kind of overshadow her immigrant experience, right? It turns out she's not actually pregnant. It's just psychosomatic. She just thinks she is. Um, and the whole kind of dramatic action of the film has to do with her refusal to believe that this is only a phantom pregnancy, right? Um, and here, too, I think we can say a lot about what that desire for natality, right, or birth represents, right? It returns us to the root of the word nation, right? It also returns us to naturalization, right? Um, all of these kind of terms for nation, right, have the, the NAT um, as their root, right? Um, and so I think those desires, again, tell us a lot about how we understand the national family, right, as something that's acquired by birth, um, and arguably stage a pretty profound critique of that. Um, 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 and um, it, it, there are also studies um, that I'll just allude to. Um, it's not accidental that we have here the heteronormative, right, or the nuclear family at issue in something like Lorna's Silence. Um, and a lot of recent studies also talk about how Republican virtue isn't just tied to a particular ethnic homogeneity, but also a heteronormativity, right? Um, um, so that um, all of that gets folded into one, right? This idea of the organic community. Um, <clears throat> So in any case, I'm going to conclude by talking, oh, you got some pictures of her with her mob bosses. There's Lorna. Um, um, for the last couple of minutes, I'm going to talk um, a little bit more about which is what's probably my favorite film example in all of these, in part because it's very overt and it's symbolism. Um, a 2002 film directed by Stephen Frears, the British director, called Dirty Pretty Things. Have people seen this? Oh, it's actually really kind of fun. Yeah, I'd recommend it. Um, um, it offers yet another figure or, or symbol that captures the exorbitant costs and kind of um, bargains that immigrant labor is willing to consent to. Um, and it does so in terms that also return us to kind of biology or human anatomy. Um, um, and also to the what we might refer to as the sickly European constitution. Um, um, in, in Dirty Pretty Things, um, it's also... Oh, sorry, that's what I was like, what's going on? I skipped a paragraph in my notes. Um, um, in any case, um, Dirty Pretty Things um, concerns um, a different kind of illegal market in immigrant labor, although this market is that of harvested body parts. Um, um, it concerns um, a manager whose name is Sneaky. He's not a very nice guy, lest there be any question. This is Sneaky. Um, you can see him again handing, he's handing a key to her, but again, this sort of trading of different passports of sorts. Um, and Sneaky, basically, he's a hotel manager <clears throat> who gets rich on the side by um, um, selling harvested kidneys. 
from illegal immigrants. So he sets up these trades where immigrants are willing to harvest a kidney and sell it for $10,000 and a European passport, right? So another kind of pretty clear emblem for what right the immigrant is willing to consent to in order to gain European citizenship. Um, and the whole right kind of drama of the plot um, 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 kind of revolves around that. Again, here the symbolism is loaded, right? Um, um, we can think about, right, what um, a kidney does, um, right? A kidney works to, right, people know this, right? It works to, like, metabolized waste, right? It's basically something that cleans waste from the body to rend it sort of pretty again, right? We can think dirty, pretty things. Um, so it, it metabolizes sort of forms of um, unfitness, right? And here the implication is it's not the immigrant bodies that are sick, right? They're the healthy ones whose kidneys are being taken out. The, the implication, right, is that it's the European body, right, that needs to plunder these kidneys of its immigrants, right? So the implication is that it's Europe that can't process its own waste, right, um, and actually needs this devalued immigrant labor, right, here again, kind of concretized in the kidney um, in order to be able to do so, right? Um, so there's a way in which, um, um, right, the European sort of homeostatic system is, um, uh, is um, falling apart, right? Um, but there's something about how that image of the kidney, the incorporated kidney also um, speaks to the vulnerability of Europe, right? This idea that, you know, the, um, Kid, what's another word for harvested? The um, removed <laughs> kidney would be like fully incorporated and very intimately, right, into this European body, right? So it also sort of speaks to the dependence of Europe financially on this labor that gets kind of disavowed or neglected. Um, the film is also pretty smart and kind of sophisticated in terms of how it inverts the usual stereotypes and biases, right? Throughout history, immigrant populations are represented, have been represented as unclean, unfit, degenerate, right? Whereas here, it's Europe, right, that can't metabolize its own waste, right? Um, so it's pretty um, clever um, in how it challenges and calls attention to those stereotypes that often drive an Im anti-immigrant policy. Um, 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 and here, too, again, it sort of exposes the myths of a healthy, functioning European constitution to actually um, depend on some of these um, black market industries, right? Um, um, and again, I think what all of these films do is um, raise questions about our expectations for both constitutions and the nation state, right? If there's a way in which we can't think about the history of the constitution as a form, or about national sovereignty as a construct without way of this body politic metaphor, right? We've always thought about the nation um, as either a unified body and democratic governments, right? Again, going back to someone like Rousseau, right? Um, in terms of this, of human anatomy, right? Um, um, and these films, I think, are incredibly savvy and sophisticated in terms of how they call into question that symbolism, right? They really point us to um, the forms of xenophobia um, um, and the reactionary sentiment that that symbolism can actually work to license, right? Our ideas about what a nation and a constitution do um, can actually work to justify very anti-democratic, anti-human rights principles. Um, and there's a way in which um, these films directly call our attention to that. They show us how the symbolism can actually be problematic and can in fact authorize um, some of the very things that we expect a constitution to achieve. Um, and I think that the work they're doing for that reason is more important than just beyond the European context. Um, within the legal community, there's often a tendency to think about constitutions as panaceas, right? We saw this in the Arab Spring. Oh, if Egypt just gets a constitution, everything will be okay, right? So there's a tendency to think of a constitution as a cure-all. Um, um, in many contexts, constitutions are also presumed to endure, right, to be kind of bulwarks. Um, they're shored up by precedent, right? There are these foundational things we can rely on. This is true in the United States, at least. I know that varies by nation. Um, um, and um, 
constitution drafting has become something of a, a kind of industry of its own for many legal academics, right? Um, um, the number of constitutions that have been written in the last 50 years are just staggering, whether Eastern Europe or, you know, formerly colonized countries. Um, and I think one of the things I'm trying to do in this project is to call into question or at least inject a little skepticism in this tendency to look at constitutions as cure-alls or inherently salvific and inherently democratic, right? And to say that there's actually something about the history of the constitution, there's a dark side, shall we say, to the history of the constitution as a form, right? That constitutions and the symbolism they connote can actually justify forms of authoritarianism, right? Or proto-nationalisms that we're not comfortable with, right? And so if we want to make sense out of where so much of the world is today, right? We also need to reckon with and take stock of some of these darker, more troubling associations of what constitutions do. Um, and I think these films are very um, um, smart about, again, I think there were other pictures I was going to show you guys, but whatever, um, about illustrating some of those, um, again, those potential casualties or risks of placing too much faith in kind of the constitution as inherently um, um, inherently an alternative or inherently pro-democratic. Um, it's something we can also, it can also condone populist sentiment, right? Or even fuel populist sentiment appeals to constitutions. Um, so anyway, um, I'm extremely eager for feedback and suggestions um, from you all eventually. Because um, again, this is material that's very much in progress um, and still needs a lot of help um, before it can be part of a book. So I'm sure you will have great things to offer to me later. Um, and I can turn this off too if you want. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you so much, really, for the very refreshing uh, look at these well, at these issues, of which are indeed all over the news. Um, it's amazing how much you can read into movies. Uh, it's, and I, well, you can see here all the added value of your literary background. Um, I, I would have a few questions myself, especially regarding the the fact that these movies are, I guess the directors of these movies are, are more left-wing yeah, uh, yeah, directors, yeah. <laughs> and, and I guess the people who are behind this proto-nationalism movement are more maybe right-wing, or I'm not sure that they that they watch that the kind of movie, so yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But anyway, I, I what was uh, uh, announced here is that I would also um, maybe say a few words uh, on um, our own research, and then maybe we can have the, uh, 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 an overall uh, discussion uh, uh, afterwards, if, if that's okay with you. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, it's a bit, sh a bit shamelessly that I take the, I take this opportunity to present this this um, collective research because I think that it has. I mean, there are clearly ties um, and connections with what you just mentioned, what, what you just explained. As, uh, but um, of course, it is different in the sense that what we are trying to do, and when I say we, there are a number of people here um, uh, around the table. Um, uh, I, I, mentioned, I saw uh, Oscar, uh, Francois, uh, Aideen, uh, well, Jeremy, uh, Cecilia, yeah, so that's a, a number of people who are uh, now working on this, on this research. And what we um, tried to do was um, also use these these literary concepts, or at least one concept is narrative, but starting from or, or yeah elaborating from uh, illegal materials uh, and then trying to extract from it some um, uh, some uh, general views about uh, the European Union uh, European integration and all that so the purpose of our research is to try and yeah shed new new light on, on the case of the Court of Justice, which of course has been worked on a lot already um, and the, 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 the goal one of the goals is to uh, combine the methods and the paradigms of both law and, and social science so because as I guess you all know um, the case law of the Court of Justice has been explored extensively from both a legal perspective and a social science perspective and they, they are very different uh, in approaches so the legal perspective is basically about describing, analyzing, criticizes, criticizing judgment based on criteria that are internal to the legal system. So that's what we usually teach our students. This is the internal point of view that is really um, the one that is, um, that is worked 
from uh, by what we call in French la doctrine, la dogmatique juridique, um, which uh, and, and which has been extensively used uh, as regards the uh, the case law of the Court of Justice. And then you have a very powerful also social sciences uh, movement that. Um, actually purportedly does not take legal discourse seriously. So that's exactly the opposite uh, in, in, in that sense. What they try and do um, is to uh, pierce the legal veil, trying to contextualize the judgments of the courts, and basically analyzing these, these judgments as the product of a specific, of a, of a never changing um, uh, social, ideological, political background. And what is striking, um, for people who work in one of these fields is that they barely talk to each other. So there is, maybe in, in Florence a little bit, but apart from that, um, they, these two bodies of scientific literature have grown in isolation from each other. Um, not that there is some sort of mutual disrespect of, or, or, or anything, but simply um, that they don't think that whatever is done on the other side by social sciences, for instance, is of any use to law and, 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 and conversely. Um, and this narrative approach, which is supposed to, to get together both uh, social scientists and lawyers, although we are predominantly lawyers so far, but not exclusively, um, the, uh, this narrative approach aims to to bridge that gap between the two um, the two communities. Um, of course, through the notion of narrative, it's very easy to to reach out to uh, social sciences because it's a word that has been used a lot in social sciences recently. Uh, it has become even maybe a buzzword, um, and sometimes it for that for that very reason it can be you know uh, looked at with some sort of distrust because it is so fashionable. Um, but on the other hand, um, it hasn't been so much used as regards, um, or in European studies in general, and especially so as regards the Court of Justice. As far as we can tell, uh, there, there hasn't been any application of this or thorough uh, analysis of the case law of the Court of Justice through, the, uh, through that, that, that concept or that an analytical grid. Um, and this is very surprising because um, I think really that this is a a bridging concept. You can, I mean, it, it can bring a lot, um, it can really help lawyers um, be fed by, um, by uh, social sciences analysis and, and also the other way around. Um, and for this particular uh, collective research, um, we believe that um, the first thing to do, of course, is for social scientists and lawyers to join their efforts in trying to unpack, to uh, um, single out a number of narratives within the case of the Court of Justice. So what are these narratives about? They are narratives about le legal integration. So to what extent can we analyze the case law as embodying, as, as um, conveying a number of uh, visions about what European integration is about? So that's really um, the first step of the research, defining the content of the narrative, tra tracing its origin in the case law, uh, that would be the first, uh, the first step, and then the second step would be to um, uh, inquire into the efficacy, the, the pervasiveness of uh, these narratives, uh, of course within the case law, but then also outside the case law, and I'd say uh, in the public at large, not just lawyers. Um, now that's the kind of issue that we think, social, and that we have seen, social scientists are quite uh, comfortable with as a kind of um, approaches that they usually take. Um, but of course, they are less comfortable with the kind of analysis that this requires, and that is a very thorough analysis of the case law, really going into the fine grain of rulings, um, and that is the kind of work that lawyers are comfortable with. So that's why they are complementary here. Um, on the other hand, the overall ambition of the research could intimidate lawyers, uh, because lawyers are usually are used to looking at the case law as little more than just a source of law, something that adds more elements to the legal system, whereas here, I mean, the whole research is based on the premise that the case law has more to tell us than just uh, something about the law, but something about uh, here the polity, the body politic, the European integration, uh, or the European Union. Um, so, as I said, the first objective of the research now is to um, map out, to classify the various narratives uh, convened in the court's case law, um, and that requires not to only look at the court's own 
narrative practices, as we call them. So narrative practices are when the court itself in a rather rhetorical fashion says, uh, you know, uh, EU, citizen, EU citizenship is destined to be the fundamental status of European nationals, They're very lofty statements. Um, that is, of course, a, a, a good starting point, but we have to go deeper than that, beyond that, and really process the whole, uh, the entire case law based on the premise that's a bit like, just like you do here, uh, anything potentially is meaningful. Any, uh, any sentence, any, any turn in the reasoning can be, uh, can be interesting for, for us. Um, and this, this first stage of the research has already uh, started. Um, um, I, can, I will circulate a table uh, that um, I uh, recently drafted based on an article that we discussed all together. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm taking a number of my colleagues by surprise here. Um, right? yeah. And um, yeah, just, just one, yeah. Um, because it's a bit more refined than uh, what we discussed last, last time. Uh, but that's just to, to show you what we're trying to do at the first stage. Um, here we have um, um, singled out uh, five different narratives. I think, well, there are probably more. Um, but these are the five first that we've identified, and we try to uh, classify them according to a number of criteria. Uh, historical status, development stage, judicial nature, position in the case law, attraction force. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll quickly go through them. Um, so the five narratives are Europe is a free market, Europe is based on shared values, Europe thrives on diversity, Europe is an association of citizens, and Europe has a social purpose. And then, for each of them, you can say, well, historically, when did they emerge? Was it at the beginning? Were they really um, uh, founding narratives, like the first two? Um, the third one, uh, we thought, was old, but maybe not founding. Um, and the, the, the last two are, are younger narratives. Uh, what, are, what is their development stage? Are they already fully developed, or are they still um, in their youth uh, growing? Um, here again, you have different uh, um, conclusions for different uh, for the various narratives. Of course, this is again very important to say that this is really a work in progress. Again, it has to be refined, and of course, it has to be discussed. But these are preliminary thoughts. Um, the digital nature of uh, the narratives. So that means uh, are these dumb predominantly judicial narratives, or have they been actually um, uh, grown or developed um, in other settings, like, I don't know, in parliament or, or uh, in, in uh, philosophical work? Uh, um, and then, then again, well, we, 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 we tried to uh, already um, characterize the, the, the narratives according to that uh, criterion. The position in the case law, that's maybe less controversial, so that's basically um, Almost based on the quantitative analysis, to what extent is the uh, is the um, uh, narrative central in the in, in the case law? Um, the attraction force that is, uh, I think, um, a, um, a criterion that is very important or at least interesting. It's the idea that very often in the case law you have two uh, in the same case you have two different narratives that that clash. That are um, that 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 and that must be in a way uh, and the conflict must be must be solved must be settled one way or another and what happens usually is that one narrative um, attracts the other into its orbit let's say and so the, it's 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 its own grammar its own categories that are um, imposed onto the other one um, and it doesn't mean that ultimately it is the dominant narrative that's going to win the case. But it is under the categories of that narrative, of that narrative, that the uh, case will be, the dispute will be settled. And so again, we think that there are narratives here that have a high attraction force, uh, whereas uh, others have a rather low attraction force. But again, this calls for much comment. <laughs> I don't have time for that, but we, we can of course also discuss that later. Um, then there is the uh, the criterion of the consistency between. Um, the case law of the court and its narrative practices. So as I said, sometimes the court issues very nice statements about what is, for instance, citizenship. And then you can say, OK, that's what you say. But what, what, what is it that you do? Is it really in line with, with what you're saying that citizenship is? 
Uh, and then, yes, a sample of, of landmark cases, key treaty provisions, an example of off narrative practices in these very various narratives. So that's the first um, type of work that uh, we are busy with uh, now. Um, now, of course, again, as I said, this is, um, I think, just the beginning of it. Uh, and even beyond this analysis, uh, there are loads of uh, directions in which uh, this uh, research could unfold. Uh, I just, and I, I, I'll finish off with that, um, I'll just mention three here. One is, again, a very legal one, which basically would require uh, analyzing the case law at a micro level, not a macro, but a micro level. That is, um, really zooming in on a very a sample of, of landmark cases and carefully scrutinizing the submissions of the parties, the advocate general's opinion, uh, the court's judgment, and try and really um, precisely uh, uh, identify the moment where the narrative starts to develop, along which channels. Um, so that would be one, one, one kind of uh, research avenue. The second one would be uh, a more of a comparative um, exercise um, that would be to compare the court's narratives with narratives of neighboring institutions like the European Parliament or the Council, but also uh, like um, the Supreme Courts of uh, member states' narratives. And that would maybe offer a fresh, a fresh look at, uh, a fresh, fresh insights into this very old uh, issue of primacy of EU law, which uh, is and remain, uh, remains very uh, controversial. Um, Third, sorry, there are four. Third uh, avenue is more of a social sciences one, uh, and actually uh, w one of the um, uh, uh, people who, who are in, in, in political science and work with us um, said that they were interested in um, is an actors-oriented investigation that would basically look at how judges themselves, uh, when they do not act as judges, but as professors or as uh, authors, uh, speakers, whatever, they themselves try to disseminate their own narratives, like, you know, good uh, uh, apostles. Uh, um, and uh, so, yeah, that, that's, that's another, uh, an, another research avenue. And the last one is more of a legal philosophy, it's, yes, it's more related to legal philosophy, legal theory. And um, because we believe that this uh, research can provide an opportunity to tackle afresh the question of what exactly adjudication and even law uh, is about. What is the role of law, uh, at least in the context of adjudication? And the premise, again, here, um, or the assumption at the heart of this research is that law has at least two different roles to play here. The first one is a role of translation. When uh, parties or, you know, clients come to a lawyer, uh, they come with statements with a view about, for instance, what European integration can be about. I heard that uh, your husband uh, gave a speech about Laval recently, but that's exactly a very good case uh, where you can see that two different parties come up with very different visions about what Europe is, political visions, ideological visions, and then they have to be translated into one single language, that is a legal language. And that is, of course, a, a key moment for, uh, uh, that's, the, that's where um, narratives really kick in, this, this idea of, of legal narratives, where you, 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 they, they can help bridge, bridge again here the gap between common parlance, uh, general statements, political statements, and the legal discourse. And then, of course, there is the second task, when, when these, um, these uh, views have been in a way harmonized or couched in legal terms, then they have to be adjudicated upon, they have to be arbitrated uh, against each other. And uh, here, of course, is a second task of the law, that is knitting, sewing together the various narratives, um, coordinating them into one operational system, and then adjudicating on their disputes. And here the intuition is that in order to achieve that objective, which is the ultimate objective of, of the law, of course, um, actually law ultimately relies on a very, very limited number of concepts uh, and principles of justice. And despite uh, all of its, you know, all its niceties, subtleties, complexity, law is really, the second role of the law is really about proportionality, equality, predictability, legal certainty. Uh, I mean, a few concepts, uh, principles of justice that you could hear in the mouth of uh, a three-year-old. Uh, so that's, that's another uh, research avenue. So that's, that was it. Um, I don't know if 
uh, those who participate in the research would like to add something now. All right. Well, then, then that's it. Then the, the floor is yours. Uh, I don't know if you or if you want to comment first on something or as you as you wish. Sounds fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>